Williams, thank you very much for coming. Again, uh, I want to welcome you to our house. And uh, again, we start this, the lecture with, again, my thoughts. And the topic this week is obligation or privilege. You know, in the third uh, Mishnah, in the first chapter of Pirkei Avos, in the Ethics of the Fathers, it states, Antigonus, the leader of Soho, he said that be not as servants who serve the master for the sake of receiving a reward, but rather be like servants who serve the master not for the sake of receiving a reward. Now, at first glance, it would seem that the mission is telling us that the most desirable way to serve God is out of pure love for him, privilege, rather than serving him because you are forced to do so, an obligation. I think the fact that the town of our mission uses the word evet, Hebrew word meaning servant, rather than ish, again the Hebrew word for man, tells us a great deal. One must realize that even though we have been created in the image of God, and that we have free will, at the same time this is still God's world, and he is the master of everything in it. We are his servants. Our very lives are in his hands. All that we own, all that we'll ever really ever own, is really his. We are truly <clears throat> his servants, and we must serve him. The only thing that we can choose in our service is the method, whether to serve him as an obligation or to serve him as a privilege. Now imagine, if your mother asked you to bring her a drink, would you feel obligated or privileged to bring it to her? One would hope we would feel privileged. But there is the possibility that we would do it out of a feeling of obligation and guilt. I think that when we get older and have children of our own, uh, then we would most definitely feel privileged to be able to honor our mother, at least as a sign of true gratitude. But what would happen if one person in the world, the one person in the world that you admire the most, someone who you respect more than anyone else that you have ever met, what if that person asked you to do them a favor? Would you see it as an obligation or as a privilege? There is little doubt that you would see it as a privilege. In fact, there is an interesting Jewish law concerning marriage. You know, matrimony in Judaism takes place between a man and woman. When the man gives the woman something of value, such as a ring, this constitutes what we call in Hebrew a kinyan, what is referred to as an acquisition. Through the act of the man giving her the ring and her acceptance of it, they now become husband and wife. <clears throat> the rabbis tell us that if a woman were to loan money to a man and she feels honored by the fact that he has accepted her money, that joy that she feels is considered enough for it to be considered as an acquisition and they are actually legally married. That is, even though he is the recipient and she has received nothing tangible from him because she feels privileged. God Almighty has given us his Torah, the Bible, and in it he has instructed us about what it is that he expects from us. The hope is that we realize the opportunity that God has afforded us. But even if we do not, the Talmud tells us in the Tractate of Sota, 47a, that me tok shalolishma balishma, that which is not done for the sake of heaven, will eventually be done for the sake of heaven. Many times when we begin our service of God, it's out of guilt. We know that we really should do the right thing. Or because we want something that we feel would need godly intervention. We want him to intercede on our behalf. We hope that if we do what he has commanded us to do, then he may in turn answer our request in the affirmative. What we call a little Jewish bribery. So by beginning with a selfish motivation in which we try to bribe God, we are connecting to our obligation. We hopefully can grow and realize that the connection that we develop can help us to reach the much higher level of serving God as our privilege. Now serving God because of obligation or privilege really changes everything in our lives. 
A person who serves God only out of obligation, in reality, lives in constant fear. He is always, he always has to be diligent in his service because it is based on fear of punishment. He may intentionally or inadvertently sin. He then feels that a vengeful God will punish him. So, in reality, he lives in a negative world. Is that what a father would want? Is that the relationship that he would want with his beloved child? Or would it be God's hope and desire that we come to serve him out of a feeling of privilege? That God, our Father, would be able to shower his son with all that is good, and that his son would revel in the wisdom and kindness of his father, yearning to find some way to serve him, some excuse to be in his presence just a little bit longer, and hoping to one day be just like his father. Now that person would live in a world filled with positive energy, happiness, and true joy. Serving would be seen as a privilege, never a burden, a true reward in itself of joy and happiness. Now, we see this scenario played out in business. If you can do it, the best advice is choosing a profession is to make your hobby your profession. Imagine rushing to work every morning, looking forward to the day. And then at night, someone has to tell you, go home. Sounds a bit utopian, but sometimes it actually happens. As it says, do what you love and love what you do, and you'll never work a day in your life. Now, many people work for the money. I believe that working only for reward actually robs the individual of satisfaction and true success. I think that there is nothing worse than looking back on your life and realizing that you made the wrong choices in life by serving the almighty dollar. Those that work for pride in themselves and their professionalism, concerned about the project, what I call the it more than the I. An interesting side fact, the word, the letter, or the word I is the only letter in the English alphabet that is capitalized in the middle of a sentence. Working for the good of it always brings about more happiness and success. But the question is, are obligation and privilege absolutes? For most of us, the two options are really blended together. To live our lives with only obligation would be dark and fearful. On the other hand, living our lives with only privilege would really be more and less than realistic at least for most of us. We read that Aaron, Aaron HaKoyin, Aaron the high priest, <clears throat> Moshe's brother, in the book of Numbers 28.2, it says of him, you shall offer one lamb in the morning and the other lamb towards the evening. This deals with the, what we call the Korban Tumid, the sacrifice that was brought every morning and evening when the temple stood. But for 40 years that he served as the high priest, he never changed any part of the service. He never innovated. He stood before God Almighty every day with the same feeling of awe and reverence. He was able to reach the level of what we call total subjugation, total bitter, before God Almighty. He was a service, his was a service of complete privilege. Now sadly for us, even if we are diligent in our efforts, how often how often can we reach true moments of privilege? But if we are fortunate enough to truly experience those feelings of privilege, then we need to cultivate those moments so that we, they can happen more and more often. You know, life is really a learning experience. It's not a choice. We need to learn. The more that we learn, the more we see God in our lives and in this miraculous world that we live in. Think about the our eyes are the windows of our souls, and we need to use them to see God and all his wonders. We should be in, con in a constant state of awe, repeating the words over and over again that we say in our prayers, Marabu Masecha Hashem. How wondrous are your deeds, God. You know, we're all human beings. 
which means we cannot see God, at least not in the present. However, in the past, if we look back on our lives, his presence and direction become very clear and evident. As the verse says in the book of Beratius and Genesis, Beyatza es hamokam, Beyaris hamokam irachok. And talking about Avram Rabino at the binding of his son Yitzchak, and it says in the Avram saw the place from a distance. Now, the Hebrew word makom, place, is also a word that alludes to God Almighty. As we say in the Haggadah, Baruch HaMakam Baruch Hu, blesses the place, blesses He, which alludes to God Almighty. He is the place, meaning that He is not in this world, but the world is within Him. His presence, so what had happened was that that moment, the verse is telling us, that God had withdrawn his presence from Abram Avinu, so as to make the test that he was going through harder. Abraham, Abraham looked into his past and saw God's presence very clearly in all that he had done in the past. Therefore, he felt very secure that God was also with him in, now in the present. Now, we too have that ability to look back on our lives, each of us individually, and we will all see clearly the divine hand of God directing our lives. Now, the town of the Mishnah ends this Mishnah with the words, and may the awe of heaven be upon you. I think these words sum up what it is that he wanted us to know and strive for. He uses the word mora, awe, and not the word yira, fear. It's interesting, the word mora, spelled with a hey, is a teacher, and mora with an olive is, deals, is awe. And we really have to learn, in essence, is what he's telling us, to serve God out of privilege. It comes with the word vayihi, which is usually something sad. So it starts with obligation, but the hope is that that will serve God not with that fear, but with the awe learn to do so. Again, the hope being that in the end we'll connect to our, our service to our God, our God, our Father, with awe and privilege and not fear and obligation. So, the question becomes, how do we connect our service to God with privilege and not obligation? The Torah connects the word hayom, which means today, with many of the commandments we are obligated to do. Why the word hayom? I believe it's because when something is new today, then we are motivated and enthusiastic. I remember being a kid, <laughs> and my father would wash his car every Sunday. My father was a car nut. Loved his car. Now at first he let me help him. And I have to say, I, I felt privileged. I felt special washing his car. But then he told me that it was now my job and I was expected to do it every week by myself. <laughs> Obligation, no fun. You know, we pray three times a day to God in the Amida, in the standing prayer. We say the words, Ashiva Shavtenu Kabarisha Novio Atsenu Kabatskhilo. Restore our judges, as they were initially, and our counselors, as they were in the beginning. We are asking God Almighty to restore our initial judgment and enthusiasm, remembering how we felt the first time we did a mitzvah and really felt a connection with the divine. Now, when serving God felt a little more at the beginning like a privilege than an obligation, you know, the mission refers to the Jewish nation as slaves, avodim. This designation comes with many laws and obligations that are placed on the slave owner. First, a Jewish man can only be sold into slavery for a maximum of six years. And on the seventh year, he must be set free. There is an exception, but it's not for this lecture. But not only must the owner set the slave free, he must do so with many gifts, so that he will be able to start his new life as a free man. The Jewish slave is called an Eved Ivri. The Torah is telling the master that yes, he is an Eved, he is a slave, and you have bought his services for the next six, six years. But always remember that he is an Ivri, which means a Jew, and he therefore just serves a much higher master. 
His obligation as a Jew, a servant of God, therefore precedes his obligations to you as a human master. This law of treating an Ebed Ivri, of a Jewish slave, with kindness and respect goes so far as the master cannot give him any menial task to do, such as polishing his shoes or giving him a haircut, unless this was the slave's profession before he became a slave. The Torah goes so far as to tell the master an interesting law, that if the master only has one pillow to sleep on at night, he, the master, cannot use it, nor can he put it away in a closet. He has an obligation to give it to his Jewish slave. This is why the rabbis tell us the one who buys an Ebed Ivri, a Jewish slave, in reality buys a master. So why am I bringing up all these laws about a Jewish slave? Now, we have a tradition. The rabbis tell us that God Almighty himself keeps his Torah. That being the case, if we see ourselves as avodim, as servants to God, then we are his slaves. And then it is his responsibility of the master to take care of all the needs of his Jewish servant and family. So God is the master. can have us work for six years or its equivalent, 60 years in this world. But then he must release us with encouragement and gifts. So if we see ourselves as avodim, servants to God, then he too has obligations to us as an Ebed Ivri, based on the Torah that he keeps. <clears throat> now the only true way to serve God and see it as a privilege rather than an obligation is through the studying of Torah. Within it are found all the answers that one would need for their lives. As we know, God and his Torah are one. He remains constant. He can't get any smarter, more righteous, more godly. But we as his children, uh, we can grow immensely by following his instruction manual. We can become more godly. We can never become God. But we can become much better human beings by following the recipe that he has given to us in his Torah. A true gift from a benevolent father to a special child. You know, the Holy Baal Shem Tov said that God Almighty loves each and every Jew even more than a mother who has waited for a child her whole life. And then, in her later years, she gives birth to a beautiful boy. Can you imagine how much love that mother feels towards that child? The love that God has for each individual is even greater. Now, there are many reasons to serve God out of privilege. But even if the only reason is because of the great love that he feels and expresses to us every day, in spite of the fact that we are such imperfect children, shouldn't we be honored and privileged to serve him? And with that thought in mind, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Sekenu quickly and in our times. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. Have a good Shabbos and a great week.